Okay, welcome everyone to Rocky River Public Library's virtual Meet the Author event. I'm Nicole Martin and I'm with the Rocky River Public Library Adult Services Department. And we are super excited to have you here tonight. Um, our special author guest is Carly West. So we are very excited for Carly West to join us. Um, she was a highlighted um, author slash artist um, last year for our virtual RiverCon, which was a Comic-Con that we ended up doing at home because of the pandemic, but uh, she was kind enough to be part of that virtually. She's an author and multimedia artist from Cleveland, Ohio. She holds a bachelor's in language education, is an award-winning character sculptor, and satirizes obscure fairy tales for a living which is a pretty good gig. Inspired by the surreal imagery of classic stop motion films, Carly creates the scholarly bananas, quirky illustrations with handmade figurines, random trinkets, and yard debris. It's as glamorous as it sounds. So she is here tonight to uh, talk about her latest scholarly banana book and um, answer our questions. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Carly. Okay, well, thank you so much, Nicole. and. Um, Thank you for Rocky River Library for having me. Um, this is super exciting for me because, uh, well, I live in Lorain County now, but I'm originally from Rocky River. I graduated from Rocky River High School in the year 2000s. And as a young, bright-eyed bookworm, I spent a lot of time in this library. So having the opportunity to chat with you guys today as an author and an illustrator means a lot to me. And uh, you could say it's like the icing on my scholarly banana cake. So in uh, this talk, you're going to learn all about my graphic novel series, The Scholarly Banana. You're going to get to know me a little bit. We're going to geek out about fairy tales. And then we're going to dive into one of my all-time favorite Grimm stories, The Juniper Tree. And as Nicole mentioned, I'm going to leave some time for questions at the end. So if you'd like to know more about the story, about my process, or like the meaning of life, I will be happy to give you answers or give you my best attempt or um, ridiculous joke about it. Um, so first, um, let's talk about what the scholarly banana is exactly. So who is this little buck tooth fruit guy and why does he exist? That is a very existential question indeed. So the scholarly banana is the star and the namesake of my sculptural graphic novel series that satirizes old creepy fairy tales and tricks you into learning fun facts about them. So the banana, um, as you see here, he is our scholarly sidekick and he accompanies us on these crazy adventures. So you can think of him kind of like our little book club buddy and he's the series class clown. He also plays a character in every story. So in um, Fitcher's Bird, which is my first book, he was an evil wizard. Um, and in the Juniper Tree, as you're gonna see, he plays a sweet little girl named Marlene. So I got really lucky that this banana just happens to be a very uh, talented actor. So uh, that's that uh, basis of the series. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is, why? <laughs> why out of all possible topics for a scholarly book, for adults and teens no less, um, would I choose fairy tales? It's one of the most lowbrow, seemingly juvenile, and probably non-scholarly subjects I could have possibly picked. Like, like where did that even come from? And my answer to that is, uh, is threefold. Okay, fold number one. Uh, the stories are bonkers. They're amazing. And I've been a fan of these types of tales and of folklore studies for almost 20 years now. And my love uh, for these obscure tales is still going strong. You know, the Grimm's, they collected their fairy tales in the 1800s. So now, like nowadays here in 2021, there's something very outdated and very odd about them. And I love that. Like, I think it's really charming. And totally interesting. And for me, like the magic and the weirdness inherent in these fairy tales always inspires me to ask questions about like, what the heck is going on here? And, um, you know, 
if you read my books, you'll know that that's something I like to do. And I get even more excited when I find out that some of my random questions that I thought were random questions actually have answers to them. And we're going to get into a little bit more of that later um, specifically. So my second reason for highlighting fairy tales is that most people can relate to them in some way. They're, they're familiar um, and they're nostalgic, they're archetypal, which means that they're everywhere and they feel very welcoming. And to me, those are really special qualities to this genre. You know, folk tales, they're, they're tales for folks, which means all of us. And I really love that even playing field where unlike highbrow, literature with a capital L, um, I don't think many people feel intimidated about venturing into the fairy tale world. You know, it's not pretentious and that's pretty awesome um, because it brings me to my final reason for uh, advocating for fairy tale studies, it's a sneaky one. Um, so reason three, as I mentioned on the surface, this does not seem like a scholarly subject. And that is precisely why I am doing this. So unlike mythology, um, where you get tons of um, like adaptations and we're, which we're taught in school, folklore and fairy tale history usually isn't taught in schools as like a serious subject that has research attached to it. So for that reason, the average person who may even be a fairy tale enthusiast, like you might even like fairy tales, you could totally like that, but and still have no idea how much cool stuff you can discover about these like really important influential tales. So as I was saying, so most people don't realize that there's this whole world of crazy cool stuff that you can actually learn in these tales. So um, now is the time to realize that. So I bring you the banana. Uh, the banana is here to rectify that situation. He shows us everything that's exciting about fairy tale history and folklore research. He teaches, he teaches us all about the cool stuff that we never knew we wanted to know, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and he'll do it with unbridled enthusiasm and heaps of pop culture jokes and lots of bug-eyed clay toys. And hopefully you'll like it. So I designed the scholarly banana to give you fun, zippy, and interesting facts about history and psychology, sociology, lit crit. It's all bundled up though in humor, art, and like claymation style gore. So it's an introduction to folklore studies, but just done in a admittedly absurd new way. And of course there's a buck tooth banana dancing around. So, you know, <laughs> there's that. But, you know, in addition to all the fun that we have, the important thing for me, really, is by the end of every book, you'll not only be entertained and you'll be an expert in a particular tale. If I really achieve my goal, you'll also feel energized and inspired to think about stories in general in exciting and creative new ways. So that's just a little behind the scenes info for you about the banana and his scholarly mission there. So on to the book. We're going to talk about the Juniper Tree today. So in 2016, um, that's when I started developing the series. And the Juniper Tree was one of the stories that first inspired me to do it and to share my undying love of fairy tale history and folklore research with the world. Um, by 2019, that concept officially became the Scholarly Banana. And um, I published Fitcher's Bird, which is book number one. Um, in late 2020, I followed that up with the juniper tree, as you might have guessed, because I kind of just told you that. Um, and so that is the story I'm going to tell you now. We're going to go through a quick rundown of it. Um, so I'm going to show you at least how I interpret the story. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the symbolism behind it. And I wanna show you just a few of the reasons uh, why the story is so unique and interesting to me. So here we go. I'm gonna put on my best narrator voice. All right, once upon a time, a perfect man married a perfect woman. And spoiler alert, it's gonna be all down here, all downhill from here. So 
As is customary in fairy tales, this unnamed man and woman are like the most exceptional humans to grace planet Earth. They are, they're kind, they're rich, they're just deliriously slap happy. Alas, this is a grim tale, which means happiness is forbidden. Because the trouble here is that aside from being nameless, um, this fairy tale power couple has just one thing missing from their otherwise perfect lives. They desperately want a perfect baby to inherit all of their wealth and awesomeness. Now, speaking of babies, uh, you need to just forget those silly creation myths about cabbage patches and storks and human biology. Um, in the Grimm universe, babies, they come from, that's right, righteous prayer. Thus, the good woman, she gets busy. She prays and she prays and she prays some more, but for some reason that is just not working. Until one winter's day, the perfect woman is chilling under the juniper tree that grows in their yard. She's just hanging out, she's living her best life and she's peeling an apple in the pure white snow as you do when you are a fairy tale character or a social media influencer. But lo, suddenly the blade slips and it slices her formerly perfect finger. Now, I do not know whether frostbite or perfect or poor knife skills are to blame here, but uh, regardless, the moment is ruined as, his, as is her snack. Uh, no worries though, instead of yowling in pain or screaming for medical attention, the perfect woman gets inspired by her gushing wounds. That's how it works, in case you were wondering. That's how creativity happens. Uh, apparently, this lady, she's the artsy type, uh, for as she stands there, freezing and bleeding out all into her yard, she sighs a deep poetic sigh and whispers, if only I had a child as red as blood and as white as snow. And just like that, she feels all better and she goes inside. So apparently that special combo move of wishing bleeding tree magic must have done the trick. For nine months later, the perfect woman gives per birth to a perfect baby boy. And the moment she sees that her miracle child is indeed as red as blood and as white as snow, she promptly drops dead. And the man buries her under the juniper tree and cries about being in this spectacularly grim tale. So in case you're wondering what just happened, um, the Grimms let us know uh, very kindly that the woman's cause of death uh, was happiness, um, which in this story is obviously fatal. But uh, don't worry, because within a sentence or two, the man stops crying, he gets remarried, and he has another child. Uh, this time, it is a sweet little girl named Marlene. And um, yeah, for whatever reason, Marlene is the only person in this story that gets a name, which makes my job as a storyteller a lot more cumbersome, but whatever. So... Moving on, uh, unfortunately, like most fairy tale widowers, the unnamed man must have been on a major rebound after his good wife's death. Um, remember how that first lady was pure and perfect? Yeah, well, this second one is corrupt and horrible. Um, and also, uh, she's possessed by Satan here. Good times. And it only gets better because not only is this lady a minion of the Antichrist, she also suffers from a debilitating case of what doctors call the murderous greed, which basically means that she is furious that the red and white boy and not her or her daughter Marlene is the sole legal heir to the family's heaps of cash money um, because, you know, archetypal villains are never really good at sharing. But uh, don't worry about her. The woman is a real professional at being a um, an evil villain and she makes the best of her situation, um, namely by practicing self-care and uh, treating the boy like absolute crap. So the real action of the story happens when one day this stepmother calls to the boy in her sweetest, most non-murderous voice and offers him a bright, shiny apple as a healthy afternoon snack. So there's a catch, though. 
if the child wants said apple, he's got to go fetch it himself out of the old storage test chest. So everybody take note that even in fairy tales, a, a balanced diet is key. So, so that's good. But um, unfortunately, as the boy reaches down for the fruit, the stepmother creeps up behind him and she slams the lid down and the boy's head flies clean off. So of course the woman is pleased with her evil achievement, but unfortunately there's no time to celebrate because now she's got a kitchen to clean and a body to hide. It's like a mother's work is never done. And I would like just to take a moment to point out that although this is a fairy tale, none of the local woodland creatures offer to come to scrub the floors, clean the pantry, or just bleach the bloodstained walls. You know, that hardly seems fair, but anyway. Speaking of evidence disposal, um, how does one hide a body in a grim tale? You know, you'd think that in a world without law enforcement, that this would be a fairly straightforward task, like, right? Like the woman could just, she could totally just dig a hole, dump the body and call it a day. But no, she does not do that. Um, apparently this stepmother is craftier than that. Like literally. So she attaches the severed noggin with a cute white scarf. She plops a shiny red apple onto the boy's cold dead lap. And then she props him up in the yard like a freaking garden gnome. All right, so later that day, uh, Marlene finds her favorite monochromatic brother just loafing in the yard, looking peaceful, stylish, and uh, if possible, a tinge whiter than usual. And of course, the girl immediately spots the shiny apple and she politely asks for a bite. But lo, the pale motionless boy is unresponsive and he does not reply. As you can understand, like Marlene, she is totally devastated. Like she needs that apple. So like any self-respecting kid, Marlene runs to her mother to tattle on her rude apple hogging brother. So naturally the woman um, who wants the best for her daughter, as we said, you know, she did all this for her. Um, she wants to give her the best advice she can. So she tells the child, you know, go follow your dreams, go back try reasoning with the boy again. So she sends Marlene back to the garden with this nugget of motherly wisdom. And I quote, if he doesn't answer, slap his face. Got it, mom. All right. Thus emboldened by hunger and idi idiocy, Marlene now attempts to renegotiate with the stone cold corpse. Uh, but this time uh, she's decided she's not gonna give up. Um, the boy does not answer her. Uh, but that's fine. Thanks to her mother, Marlene is now a certified expert in conflict resolution. In other words, now it's on. So Marlene winds up and slaps the boy with her tiny hands and his head rolls off again. Okay, so Marlene scurries home to report the fatal accident and surrender herself to the authorities. And this girl, this poor girl is just wild with grief and panic. She thinks that she's just annihilated her only brother like Mortal Kombat style. So back at home, the woman tries to comfort the poor distraught child who unfortunately can't distinguish a living person from a corpse. But rather than teach Marlene this valuable life skill, the woman decides to frame her for murder instead, as you do. So first she makes Marlene promise not to tell anyone about the accidental beheading. Then she collects the forensic evidence, finally, <laughs> uh, but then she chucks it in a stew. So Marlene is now reeling with PTSD, but her mother puts her to work in the kitchen anyway, because apparently fratricide is no excuse for laziness. But don't worry though, this is a grim tale. So we know that misery has its perks. As Marlene is weeping over the cooktop, um, the Grimms want us to know that her tears then fall over the meat and it just seasons it perfectly. So um, yeah, remember that handy life uh, hack next time you're out of salt or you have been just framed for murder. 
So um, at long last, the man finally returns home from wherever the heck he was. Uh, he takes a quick inventory of family members. He calculates shrewdly that a child is missing and he inquires about the red and white boy. Like, where's my kid? Um, I guess he has not seen tonight's menu. And, you know, we all know it's it really it's not easy to tell somebody that you braise their child. So instead, the woman decides to whip up a quick lie. She says, the boy has taken a last minute vacation. Yeah, you know, this that's sole legal heir to the family's just heaps of cash money. Yeah, he's just gone far, far away. And he's going to be gone for a long, long time. Yeah, that's a story. So the man is obviously bummed that his jet setting son didn't say goodbye to him. But in true fairy tale style, uh, he gets over this immediately. And really, can we blame him? You know, it's dinner time. The guy just wants to eat. He doesn't feel like discussing trivial matters like the whereabouts of his child. Besides, we'll see the boy again soon. So um, moral of the story, even the most humble ingredients can be transformed into a delicious gourmet meal. The man devours the meat like a beast. And in a gluttonous frenzy, he hurls the bones to the floor like a deranged Neanderthal. He does not question what's in his bowl, whether it's organic or gluten-free or his firstborn son. He is too busy scarfing it down. So as the man devours the homegrown feast, Marlene slinks away from the table. She gathers up all of her brother's bones and she wraps them in her favorite silk handkerchief. I just wanna let you know that this is a tribute, not a burrito. And then sweet little Marlene goes to the juniper tree. She solemnly lays down the burrito and then she cries about being in this spectacularly grim tale. But lo, delighted by the misery and death, the branches of the juniper tree began swaying back and forth as if, um, and I quote, as if clasping their hands for joy. And suddenly the clapping tree just explodes into a spectacular Vegas style production complete with magical mist, smoke and flame. And for the main events, a beautiful red and gold bird just bursts from the fire singing magnificently like a tiny avian Elvis. But unfortunately, as quickly as it came, the fire extinguishes itself, Elvis bird flies away and the juniper tree just reverts to its dull tree-like state but curiously, the bone burrito has disappeared. And stranger still is little Marlene's reaction to these dangerous paranormal events. This is my favorite part. And I had to put this in as a quote, prepare thyself. Here we go. Little Marlene felt just as happy and relieved as if her brother were still alive. She returned home filled with joy and sat down at the table to eat. So I have nothing. <laughs> um, so while the family eats whatever it is that they're eating, the bird heads to town to run some errands. So he soars above the treetops singing the sweetest song. It goes something like this. Um, I'm not a singer, so we're just going to spoken word this thing. My mother, she slew me. My father, he ate me. My sister, little Marlene, gathered my bones, tied them up in silk, and put them under the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a fine bird I am. So um, over in town, the bird song is like an instant viral sensation, which only makes me think that the goth scene must be huge there. Um, who sings lyrics like that? But because music streaming hasn't been invented yet, um, all the local shopkeepers, they have to like bum rush the street and they, and they have to beg the creature for an encore. The only problem is like magic birds, they never sing twice for free. I mean, everybody knows, like that's how they get you. So um, the business savvy bird then barters his song for a snazzy gold chain. 
a pair of red shoes, style and, st style and size unknown, so I just guessed, and a big honking millstone. Um, I just want to let you know, I do not know what the going rate of a millstone is, but I assume this is a pretty good deal. So um, having collected the necessary inventory items now to complete the story, the bird uh, now can prepare for his grand finale tour. First, he slips the millstone around his neck like some badass collar. And then with swag and claw, he soars back to the June tree as graceful as a bird, a super ripped bird that is. So moments later, the family hearers what else but mellifluous prophetic squawking coming from the juniper tree and this time the bird song it gets mixed reviews so the man loves it the woman hates it and little marlene is just back to crying again so who knows it's kind of a tough crowd but just like the village groupies, the man just cannot get enough of the bird's catchy tune, and he totally ignores his wife's protest and flies outside to catch the live show. And as he rushes the juniper tree stage, the bird ring tosses the gold chain, which lands perfectly around the man's neck. It's an amazing shot. So adorned with his new bling, the man then scampers inside to tell his family about this incredible gift dispensing bird. So he says, all right, well, if this creature is passing out free jewelry, perhaps he brought stuff for everybody. Unfortunately though, the stepmother is being a real killjoy and uh, she seems to be the only perceptive person in the story for she has balled herself into a fetal position and flat out refuses to go outside, which I have, ha I have to say is by far the most sensible reaction we have seen yet in this story. It is also nice to know that at least one person besides us can hear those creepy lyrics. I just, I'm just saying. But of course, little Marlene likes gifts and has no fear of mysterious human voiced birds. So thus, while the man rocks out and the woman cowers in terror, the little girl goes outside to claim her prize. And as Marlene approaches the tree, the bird tosses down the pair of random red shoes, which I think is super impressive because shoes to me seem like a really tricky gift to give somebody. So meanwhile, back inside, the woman has a really serious problem going on. She totally knows that the bird has come to destroy her. But the problem is she also knows that this feathered minstrel of death is giving away free stuff. Like, dude, it's free stuff. Like. It's awesome. Like what, what is she supposed to do? So after a lot of consideration, her choice is clear. She gathers her courage. She just stuffs down her intuition and she goes outside to get what's coming to her because maybe it's a pony. So as she approaches the juniper tree, the bird lobs down the big honk and millstone and kills her right there on the spot. So Turbocharged by the gratuitous bloodshed and mayhem, the juniper tree now busts out its signature magic trick one last time. The mist is swirling around the millstone and presumably the woman's squashed carcass. And behold, the red and white boy rematerializes with his cranium securely attached. And now our spectacular grim tale comes to an end. In true fairy tale style, little Marlene, the unnamed man, and the resurrected red and white boy celebrate the reunion as a slap happy family of three. And in case you're wondering, no, nobody mentions the shape shifting child, the magic mist, the yard pyrotechnics, or the fact that their dear wife slash mother was just massacred by a songbird all in front of their eyes just two seconds ago. Nope. Instead, the man and his children embrace one another. They skip back to the house. And of course, they eat. The end. 
And my friends, that is the story of the juniper tree. Okay, well, it probably won't surprise you if I tell you that this story is frequently at the top of lists for being one of the most violent and controversial fairy tales around. You know, cannibalism will tend to do that. And you know, it, it, it is obviously very, uh, a very gory tale. And uh, in fact, there actually was an attempt to outright ban the story after World War II. But, you know, um, as we know, even like with things happening today, uh, cancel culture is a, is a complicated issue. And so the ban, even though people wanted it, it never quite stuck. There were people on like both sides. Um, and I think that's that's one of the interesting parts about it. Not Not that it was banned, but that it actually, um, it had so many redeeming qualities to it. Uh, one of them is one of my favorite details about this tale that makes it also known as one of the most uh, artistic fairy tales around. And it it's, stands out as being really different. So I'm gonna talk to you just for a minute about some of the symbolism that you might find a little surprising to be in such, um, a shocking and gruesome tale. So um, one of the things that is helpful to know kind of before talking about the symbolism is where the, the story comes from. So the Grimm's were collectors of fairy tales in the 1800s in Germany. And in general, their, their mission definitely was to collect the countryside oral tales and preserve them for, um, you know, storytelling reasons and nationalistic reasons um, just to this was at a time where storytelling was fading out of fashion and they wanted to make sure that all these tales were um, were kept and they they studied them. Not every tale though, and this is kind of a fun little fact, not every tale was a countryside collected tale. The juniper tree was one of the few um, tales in the collection that was actually a literary fairy tale. It was submitted to the Grimm's for publication by um, a, actually a well-known artist uh, named Philip Otto Roon. And this guy was pretty impressive. So he was um, he was this romantic German romantic painter and obviously a writer and a really artistic fellow. He did um, studies about the color wheel and um, painted all these religious paintings. And he was a very devout, um, a devout Christian as well and painted a lot of um, like cherubs and like religious style paintings. And uh, one of the things about the juniper tree is that it has a lot of coming from Rune, it has a lot of very overt Christian symbolism in it, um, which is kind of, I think is kind of cool to think about in a story that's so over the top, it feels like a B, B movie, like a horror movie. Um, but that absolutely was not the message behind it. It was something completely different, actually. So uh, the good news is if this story um, is nausea inducing for you, take comfort in what I'm about to show you. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you the uh, three symbols that I thought were kind of interesting about um, that appear in this tale. So the first one is the phoenix bird here. So the, the red and gold bird is a mythical phoenix. Um, he is known for uh, setting himself on fire. Every hundred years, he, uh, he torches his nest and is reborn from the ashes. So in many cultures, actually, he's, he's a sign, this bird is a sign of eternal life and just, you know, just immortality and things like that. It's also used uh, in the Christian symbolism um, to be, to symbolize uh, the resurrection of Jesus. So the boy actually is um, kind of parallels to a Christ figure which I thought was actually kind of interesting. Um, now the second 
the second little symbol, this is my favorite one because it's the one that is the most provocative out of all of them, is the red and white stew. So this is one of the, well, this is the most notorious scene of the entire story of this cannibalism scene, which yes, it's vile and it's awful. And you're like, oh my God, what the heck am I reading here? But, you know, researchers point out that in a story that is so rich with um, kind of this Christian backbone. And I do go more into this in the book, by the way, um, about how it's really linked um, through Rune and um, just how that, that all works. Uh, but researchers point out that in a story that's this overtly Christian, it's pretty clear that this, this scene with the boy and in the stew um, could very well be this like the connection to the, to the Eucharist and the, the the idea of communion. So if you look at it that way, it's a lot less terrible and a little bit more like, oh, it's Sunday school class. So, you know, it all depends on how you look at it. Um, but um, likely that was kind of the, the feeling that they were going for there. So that's that. And then the third uh, symbol I wanted to show you here was this seemingly random millstone thing. So uh, this might be my favorite one because I distinctly remember reading the juniper tree um, a lot and al always thinking like this millstone has to be the most bizarre way to kill somebody I have ever seen. Like, can you make it any more difficult on yourself, bird? Like you got to fly to town, shop for this thing, lug it back. Like, could you not use your beak on her or like were there no rocks around? Like, why, why a millstone? And for a while, I just thought like, oh, it's just the story is just being weird. It must just be weird. Um, and it's, it's actually, that wasn't what was happening. It's, um, the millstone is another biblical reference. So, and which I had no clue um, my, when I was reading, I only found out through the research of people pointing out that in the Bible, there's uh, they'll they'll make uh, references to different uh, punishments for different crimes, and uh, for people who harm children, um, the the punishment of having being drowned with the millstone, like attached to them, um, and then you know, dropped in the sea with a millstone around their neck, or being crushed by a millstone, is um, happens over and over again. I was like, that is super interesting because here's this thing that I was like, oh you silly story. You're so weird with your millstone. <laughs> how, how weird. No, no, no. There was actually, there's actually a legit connection there. I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, I would never have thought that. Um, when you put it that way, it makes a heck of a lot more sense. So um, those are just some of the things I, I really enjoy uh, finding out in the research about I guess surprising little things, especially in stories that are that seem so different to us, um, and that's so easily dismissed as being strange. I really enjoy that discovery of learning more about them, and um, just getting a different perspective on it. Um, something I just like to do. So that that vibe is in all of the books. Then, consequently, so if you're interested. I uh, definitely go check those out. I explain a lot more in um, in the actual books of the Juniper Tree, and we do similar things in Fitchersburg. And um, that's about all I have for you today. I also wanted to mention that um, I do have a third book um, in the works now. It's uh, hopefully coming 2022. We're going to do uh, Little Red Riding Hood, which is going to be, I believe, a trio of Little Red Riding Hood stories. So you can learn all about the crazy stuff that happens with that tale, which is a little bit more, um, more mainstream and well-known. So that should be exciting. So yeah, if anybody has any questions about anything, um, story, Grimms, I know I, I breezed over a lot of things, um, but uh, yeah, if you have a question, I'll be happy to answer it. Tell you about life, the universe. I'm in my studio so I can show you whatever. I've got tools, I got stuff, so.
Thank you so much, Carly, that, you know, it's just, it is really, I, I think you said bonkers, a bonkers story. It really is. Um, and it's so great to be able to have an approachable format for people to read these because, you know, like you said, you, you might not I have ever come across this story otherwise. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I look forward to the little, little Red Riding Hood since that is more of a well-known story. And I yeah. don't think a lot of people know the actual the dark original version so <laughs> yeah yeah and there's it's interesting because there's a progression of three there's the big three and it's it's pretty cool um so we're gonna see if i can do it and uh so you can see this is uh one of the 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 primary antagonist here you can see him in his little fuzzy head so it's in the works now i'm in my um the earliest phase of drafting that so like i said hopefully 2022 We'll see. Awesome. Well, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or go ahead and um, unmute yourself if you'd like. We, I can unmute you. Uh, let's see, Sherry has a comment. This is without question the best Zoom Sherry has ever had the privilege to watch. Oh my gosh. Sherry, you're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> You are an absolute genius. Sherry looks forward to Little Red Riding Hood. Where might one purchase your books? Anywhere books are sold. Um, if you want to support indie bookstores, they can order them. If you want to shop any other retailers or the thing that sounds like Amazon, that's available there too. Um, so yeah, um, if, if you don't see it somewhere at retail, you can ask them to purchase it and they will get it for you. Let me um, pop a link in here for you, Sherry, because we did partner with Apple Tree Books over on the east side. Um, if you would like to purchase from them, they are our official partner for our Meet the Author series. So I can go ahead and share that there. But um, if you want to order a book and also, you know, if while you're waiting for it to come, we have um, all of Carly's books in our collection at Rocky River as well. Yeah. Yeah. And if, um, you know, you can always send me a message too. Um, my website is uh, the scholarlybanana.com. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me there. And I've, you know, I've got bookmarks and stickers and stuff and um, be happy to answer anything or chat with you. So yeah. Yeah. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. That means a lot to me. So this is a uh, a new series. I'm an indie author. Um, I know since I didn't mention this, I am the writer. And maybe I should have told you this. <laughs> <laughs> like, who's this person? Oh, I guess Nic Nicole mentioned it. I introduced you. Yeah. <laughs> God, you, you took care of it. Oh, gosh. I have another. I was talking to Nicole earlier. I have um, an, an, another author talk um, that you could see. It's posted on Cuyahoga County um, Public Library's uh, Facebook page. It's an hour long talk where I go into all my process and the development of the series. So that's a whole nother ball of fun. Um, but I wanted to make this one special since um, Rocky River is my hometown. Like I'm going to change it up for you guys and do something really different um, and focus more on the, the story itself uh, rather than the, the process. But yeah, um, I guess since I said process, um, Oh, I get now Nicole mentioned this too. All my stuff is made from um, sculptures and polymer clay. As I was trying to trying to multitask and hold it up, this is the little uh, little Marlene um, scholarly banana. So I have lots of lots of fun stuff around here. It's always a good time. Okay, so I, I put your website in the chat as well. So if um, you guys want to pop on over there. Carly has a ton of super cool stuff on her website. Um, and we're so happy that you're able to have this kind of nice full circle moment of um, us being your childhood library and you getting to do a program for us. So. I blame you guys for all the weirdness. If you think it's weird, blame Rocky River Library because that's we are where I think it as a child. <laughs> <It's your fault. laughs> Well, even though you probably weren't born. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will gladly take responsibility. <laughs> All right. It's on you. <laughs> we do have quite um quite a collection of fairy tales as well. If anyone's interested in doing their own research, there's a lot of interesting um 
just so much to dive into there. I always think when people talk about strange fairy tales, I always think of the one, um, the girl without hands. Oh yeah. Where dad chops off her hands. That's a nice one. Yes. Yes. My radar of, oh, there's some really like, there's some Just out there. Yeah. There really are. It's yeah, so, so interesting when um, people have only been familiar with fairy tales from Disney. Yeah. And then you hand them, you know, the scholarly banana and. Yeah. Well, well, since you said Disney, I guess I'll, I'll tell you something about Disney. Um, so um, another thing that people say a lot, which I think is makes total sense is people are like, Oh, you know, those, the Disney, they changed all the original. It was really, you, you got to like the Grimm's, the original ones that were, you know, pure, these original dark fairy tales that just kind of came from the people, you know, the Grimm's, the Disney though, they were all about money and they've changed everything. Well, I will tell you, um, and I love this because it shows that people are all the same. Kumbaya. And I mean this in a good way. It's just how things, how things are. So the Grimm's, um, so a lot of people are like, oh yeah, the Grimm's, those are the original ones. No, they weren't. <laughs> They were not. So the Grimm's were people too. So what ended up happening, and I'd go through this in my uh, the introductions of uh, my books, touch on some of the history behind the Grimm's. That so the Grimm's are collecting these fairy tales, and originally they were doing it for um, an academic audience. They're like, we're going to collect all these things, and they transcribed these tales um, pretty much verbatim. So it was kind of rough. It was like doing something without rehearsal. You're like, hey, okay, well, all right. So people reading those like normal people, <laughs> like non-professors were like, what is this garbage? And they actually outright were like, this is, this is like junk. And so the Grimm's collection was not well received. The first, um, the first edition, except for the juniper tree. Fun fact there, the juniper, and you know why? It's because the juniper tree was freaking literature. Cause that one was submitted by this art dude. So it was fancy, but the majority of people didn't like them. Like they didn't like the, how it felt, it was too rough. So what ended up happening is over many years um, between 1812 um, and 1857, the Grimm's released seven editions with each edition, there was more and more changing that they did to these stories to make them more marketable because the Grimm's needed money too. The Grimm's need to eat. So that's what they did. So even the Grimm's tales weren't, you know, they weren't immune from the realities of what it is to need to survive and get money. So I, I thought that was kind of cool um, just to challenge that and be like, oh, well, you know, that's how storytelling works. And it's not a slight on the Grimm's. That's actually, if anything, that's a defense of Disney of saying, well, that's, there's nothing wrong with changing stories. That's actually how stories survive. And that's one of the coolest parts of, I think about the folk tales. That's why in both books, um, and I am planning for all subsequent books to have a section that is similar tales from around the world to show how different tales take, can have the same core, but then they take on different nuances. And that's one of the cool things just about being a person. You know, and like, I, I think that's like, that's amazing. It's another kumbaya moment. Like I, that's, that's a reason in itself to be like, oh, we're all, this, we're all messed up. That's awesome. <laughs> Cause really, like, if you read some of the similar tales, you're like, oh, I thought the Grimm's were bad. Jeez, this, this tale is kind of, this, this bird's dropping needles and nails into people's mouths and making them swallow it. Holy cow. Like it's oh but then the next one's even crazier you know it's everybody's crazy <laughs> I like that. That <laughs> everybody's crazy that's oh, the lesson oh, Carly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know that's such a good point though Carly and I'm glad you mentioned that that you know we shouldn't we can't rag on Disney because the Grimm's were also trying to publish and be successful and, you know, stories adapt to their time and culture um, to be more palatable, right? Or to be more marketable. And that's just the way it goes. Absolutely. And one of my goals for this um, whole series is just to get people to ask them, 
you know, the absurd ones or even the more serious ones being like, what is this story telling us about what's going on now? Because it doesn't all have to be through history. It's easier to see history because we're not in it. But you can be like, oh, well, why did they do that? Why is the story I'm watching now doing that? Because everything's a choice. And it's just kind of interesting to think about. You know, I just like thinking about it. And I think it just helps people. Um, I think it's I think it's just good just to have those questions in mind, not in a in an angry, judgy way, or a judgy way at all, just as a thinking way. So that's yeah, just like a critical thinking yeah, sort of just, exercise, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah, just to just to just to think of like what's the what could be going on, not judging, just questioning. So, like I said, if you if you read the books, you know that I love a I love a question. <laughs> what's what is happening here? Uh, you know, I'm with you. I studied philosophy in college, so I'm all about bringing on the questions. <laughs> nice, you would. Okay. <laughs> One of the books that actually inspired me earlier to to get into that, um, I guess. Uh, well, like like you mentioned, I'm in an education a major. I'm a Spanish education, um, but I loved my flaw the philosophy class. I took. I really enjoyed that too. And I got a book called um, Intro to. Oh God, I was going to say Intro to Philosophy. Oh, how many books are called Intro to Philosophy? I don't remember the author. Oh, well, that's not going to help us. Well, anyway, <laughs> good story, huh? Um, it was this really lighthearted approach at just doing the uh, from ancient times through modern of just talking about different philosophers. And it it had different uh, little funny little comics through it that really lightened it. So you're reading all this very, um, uh, it could be very heavy. And how intense it is that you have to like think about these like logic things but then it it would show you a really goofy cartoon and i really liked it a lot so i i did make the series in the spirit of that one philosophy book that that i really liked because I, I i enjoyed it a lot and i was kind of reading it for fun and i was like oh i like the i like the pictures too so maybe i'm just not you know maybe i'm just a giant kid and that's why i'm like oh we need pictures and we need jokes but um Hey, I, I like it. So I was, I just made it thinking, well, I hope someone else likes it too. <laughs> so, <laughs> if I did, if well, I, I did, do, right? <laughs> there's probably at least a few more that do. So I'm just, I'm still just going on that. Like I said, I'm Indian, I'm new, so I don't even know yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carly, we have a few more minutes left. So um, and we don't have any questions that's, that have come through, but I was thinking if you could just show us maybe since you're in your studio, some pieces that you um, have used for past books or just some cool studio stuff for the, for the last few minutes. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to take out, um, I'm going to try to do this. Oh, you know what? Let me um, not have this Zoom here. I'm going to change my video. So um, here's the bird. Now, one thing I do is I never put pupils on them. And that's because I add that in digitally in Photoshop so they can look around and I can decide later where I want them to look. I also draw the eyebrows on. So another detail about my sculptures, and this is the case for like, whoop, <laughs> for everybody. Uh, as you can see, I make them uh, with different parts on here so they come apart. Oh, good as new. Um, so I put holes in the bottom of all my sculptures and that is so I can insert this um, high-end art device called a toothpick in them. And what I do then is I have a piece of, well, this is wood, but I just have a piece of foam and I'll just stab a little, um, stab it in there and that holds them up so I can stand back and take a photo of it. So that's the magic of how that works. And if you see anybody that has legs, like spindly legs, like, like our pal Satan here. So Satan, if you can see, actually has a wire in his foot. So it's the same deal. I will stick him in a piece of foam so he can stand and model for me um, while I take a picture of him. So that's how that works. Um, I'm going to show you here. This is for Little Red Riding Hood. I'm going to show you this is just different material. Um, this is actually this rock. I'll show you all kinds of stuff. This is a piece of XPS foam, which is, looks like this. 
that I just cut up with a box cutter and glued together and painted to look like a rock. So it's super lightweight, but it's made from this um, foam stuff that I got at um, like Menards or Home Depot. So this is another example of people sticking in foams. Here's um, Jakob, um, oh, I'm sorry, Wilhelm Grimm um, on there. This is little Red Riding Hood's uh, little basket concept that I'm working on again with a toothpick in there. Um, I got, oh. So one of the other things I do is, so I don't have to make a thousand figurines to do this. This took me a little while to figure out. Ooh, hey, hello cat. Um, <laughs> um, I make the bodies and the heads separately. So I can swap them out as I need to. So if they need different expressions, I can easily do that and tilt their heads around. And um, as you can see, this has no arms. So I'll put, um, I'll put the arms on with uh, raw clay and bend them as, um, as needed. So that's how I, that's how I manage doing this with, with sculptures. I do them all like in this modular sort of way, um, you know, except if it's a real simple character. So here's the woodland creature that came to clean up the, the blood. So we have our, our beaver and our bunny. Um, these types of characters I make really fast. Like I'll be like, oh, I need a mouse, go. And I'll give myself like a minute to make the mouse. Um, <laughs> I used to have a sculpture business called the Republic of Cute. Um, so I did a bunch of shows around the Cleveland area um, for a few years. My business is mostly online, um, but I was one of the original vendors at the Cleveland Flea for the first, I think like two seasons maybe, when it was, when it was really good. Um, so yeah, it, but yeah, it was, a, it was a good time. So anyway, I have a lot of experience sculpting so I can make things very quickly. This is a little violin that I just wanted to give the banana um, for like one of the death scenes so he could be playing his, I cannot see this camera thing. So he can be playing his sad song. So, I'll, you know, I'll, a lot of times when I'm photographing, I'll think of ideas um, of like, oh, he needs a, a violin. So I'll just kind of go to the side and do that real, real fast. I do everything in this room. I'll set up a folding table and, and shoot and photograph. And then I've got like my sculpting tables back there um, with all my materials and I'll just kind of do it real fast. But um, the, I guess the other thing I want to tell you about that is, uh, so a lot of people think I spend all day sculpting. Yeah, I do not. <laughs> it's so quick um, and I get it all done um, or I'll just do them as needed really fast that is like a fraction of the time. Most of my work is designing and editing. It's mostly writing, but actually mostly it's rewriting. I am a rewriter. Um, I'm a very messy writer. So my work is artist and author. So I split both and I do both at the same time, but it's, um, yeah, I, it's that editing, man. That's, <laughs> that's where I am like all the time, just trying to figure out better ways to communicate something or how to make a joke snappier or, you know, doing that stuff. So that's the, that's the gist of the process. Like I said, there's a, I do have another video out there on um, CCPL's Facebook that you can see, uh, I do a whole rundown of, of the, the process uh, there, but um, yeah, that's, Awesome. I, I think you have it linked on your on your website too, Carly, the, the Facebook oh, I video. I so um, people can check it out on there as well. Um, that thank you so much for that sneak peek into the studio. I'm I have to say, I expected you to say you spent more time sculpting. So Oh no, like I said, that's what most and I don't blame, you know, that it seems like I would, but it's so it's such a sliver. It's it's crazy. But yeah, if uh, if anybody wants me to do more um, like studio types of tours, you know, that's something I'm I'm kind of thinking about how to do it. It's uh, right now I'm not really sure what people want to know, so I'm like, eh. 
I don't know. There's so much to know. So, so much. Yeah, I'll figure it out. Thank you so much, Carly. Yeah. Oh, um, so I don't want to keep you any later. Um, so thank you so much. This was awesome. Um, I'm so glad we got to have a nice little story experience with you and hear some more about the juniper tree and see your little studio. Um, super cool. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you in person at the Rocky River Library um, next year for, for hopefully some hands-on awesomeness. Um, yeah. yeah. So that would be amazing. Like I said, my childhood library. So it, it, yes. this, one of the, this is the talk I was like, this one, Got me in the feel. Uh, so, oh, yeah. Many, I'm, many, I'm so many, happy. many hours upstairs in that little room with those little windows. So uh, it means a lot to me. So thank you, Nicole, and the library for having me. So I appreciate it very much. And thank you, Sherry, and my mom, <laughs> and anyone who's watching this in the future. Thank you for watching. So. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for um, our attendees for being here. Thank you, Carly, for everything. Um, and I will be sure to share with the other librarians this story of librarian uh, patron dreams coming true. So nice. <laughs> makes us all warm and fuzzy inside. So Good. Good. Fuzzies. Have, a, have a great night. Um, and we will hopefully see everyone soon. <laughs> Sounds good. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Cut, cut. Real. <laughs> Super real. Okay. Well, I'm all right. I'm sorry. I was trying to like be mindful in case I just dropped off the face of the earth because I care. Well, let me see. If <laughs> Thank I you. What I was talking about. Well, anyway.